Welcome to this episode of Athletic Training Chat. We have Will Adams on the podcast today, and Will Adams is someone I went to college with, but who has since then gone on and done his master's in um, doctoral work at the University of Yukon and did a ton with the Corey Stringer Institute and everything with heat-related issues and stress. Uh, we get into the depths of what that looks like and how and why it should be 100% survivable and the steps you should really take in order to make sure that you have a plan in order to make it so something like that, a very serious event, can be 100% survivable. We also talk very in-depth about how athletic trainers play a major role in that process and that being the first line in a lot of cases for issues with that, it is up to us to make sure that we're really taking the lead on those things to make sure that the patient we are with is getting the care that they need to, again, make it 100% survivable. Lots of great takeaways from this one. Really hope you enjoy it, and go ahead and check out this episode. Sounds good. Well, we'll get this started. Uh, welcome to this episode of Athletic Training Chat. We are on with Will Adams, who I got the pleasure of getting to know during our time at UW Madison. Uh, we were both undergraduates, I believe. Will you were two years behind me? I think maybe. Super uh, yeah. long ago. I graduated in '09, so. No, maybe just a year behind me then. December of '09. Yeah. Yep, so a year behind me then, because I did December of 08, I'm okay. fairly certain. But anyway, uh, Will has been up to a whole lot since then, um, now a decade ago, which makes me feel old every time I say it. Uh, but a lot focused around heat illness, hydration, the importance of um, all of those things, and those, and we've seen that becoming more of a hot issue, um, as it should be, just in terms of the prevention. But Will, I'm going to let you turn it over just on what you've done since your time at Madison, and where you're at now, and then we'll start getting into the deeper conversation. Yeah, no. So, um, as as Joel said, um, him and I met each other. Uh, I, I it kind of sucks that uh, you mentioned it was over a decade ago because I didn't really want to think about that. But, right. Sorry. You know, we, we met a, a long time ago um, um, during our time at, at University of Wisconsin um, and everything. So my my background and kind of where I went from Wisconsin to where I am now. Um, you know, graduated in 2009 at, at UW Madison, and then I uh, went to University of Connecticut and did my master's degree there. Um, to get a GA position, so I was working at, at, as an athletic trainer at a, at a um, larger high school outside of Hartford, Connecticut, and then I'm um, doing my, my master's work at, at UConn. Um, during my master's, I did a, a research thesis, and my thesis was really focused on um, the – uh, high school head football coach and their perceptions uh, of an athletic trainer and really um, more focused on their knowledge of exertional heat stroke um, from a prevention perspective as well as um, an, uh, a management perspective as far as what coaches would be qualified to do from a management if they suspected a, a, a heat illness. Um, so did that for my master's thesis. Um, during my master's, I got involved with um, – uh, more involved with the Corey String Institute um, and starting to do some more, um, you know, lab-based research there. Um, considering my master's thesis was more qualitative in nature, um, and fell in love with research. So I, I thought going, leaving, leaving Madison, going to UConn. I thought I was going to go do two years um, work at, at a high school and then go do an NFL internship, hopefully, and then you know work, um, you know, Division One football or, or in, in the NFL. Um, but then I fell in love with research, and then uh, that's why I decided to continue my education and, and where I am today. So um, after my master's degree, I stayed at UConn um, and um, stayed with Dr. Doug Casa, who is my, my advisor, um, and was there for my PhD for four years. Uh, the first two years, um, I still worked clinically. Um, I became involved with um, the athletic training services we, we, we provided to our club sports athletes. Um, there. Um, so I was there for two years. Um, um, the first year um, was really the first full year of athletic training services being provided to the club sports athletes. A good friend of mine had started that a year before um, 
a, a, a year and a half prior to that, um, got things up and running finally. And, and him and I kind of took the reins and went forward. And then, um, he had stepped away from club sports and I kind of took the, the, um, sole head position there and, um, grew the program and was able to get, um, um, a third athletic trainer hired for the club sports, um, 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 student athletes that we covered um, without expanding coverage, which I thought was a, a, a unique piece because oftentimes that doesn't happen in athletic training Definitely. or have more staff, but you know, we have to have you more, you could cover more things. So I was able to add a third person, um, but keep it at only six sports that we were covering just based on the needs that we had for our, our right. students. Um, after those two years of club sports, I went and I, um, I started, um, becoming more involved with the athletic training program at, at UConn. Um, so I taught some undergrad courses, um, um, in the athletic training program. Um, and then I spent the rest of my time with um, the Corey Stern Institute or, or KSI. I'll just use that because it's quicker and easier to say. Um, with KSI, um, most of my efforts were really focused on um, health and safety policies, particularly within high school athletics, um, just because of the, of the unique nature of, of high school athletics and, and um, how policies are um, developed and adopted and implemented and in, in, in all that. Um, and uh, my dissertation was really focused on um, looking at exercise-induced dehydration on um, neuromuscular control and, and sleep um, and recovery. So looking at it from a um, perspective where we get people dehydrated up to 5% of their body mass during a three-hour bout of exercise, and then we see how they recover for over the next 24 hours, bring them back to the lab. So that was a really cool project. Um, found some interesting findings um, that I'm still kind of going through some of the data, you know, still, and it's been a long time. Right. Um, I was doing that. Um, I stayed at UConn for a postdoctoral fellowship after my PhD for a year. Um, again, getting more involved and working more closely with high school um, athletics associations from a, um, a health and safety policy perspective or health and safety, health, health and safety perspective um, and overseeing some large scale studies um, there. Um, and then after that, I came to University of North Carolina Greensboro or UNCG, um, where I'm the program director for our interlevel master's um, um, program for athletic training. And um, I'm also uh, director of um, the Hydration and Environmental Thermal Stress Lab, which is the lab that I oversee um, within our exercise physiology lab here at, at UNCG. Um, current projects right now, um, been doing um, some work in the environmental chamber, looking at um, various cooling modalities to see um, the efficacy of using those modalities on, on cooling people who are hyperthermic. Um, and a lot of my efforts have been spent over the past year and a half looking at um, habitual fluid intake on health and wellness um, in various populations, um, particularly right now looking at um, racial and ethnic differences in, in the college age population to try to get some better, a better understanding as far as their behaviors um, from a fluid intake perspective. Very nice. You've been busy. Yeah, to say the least, I'm a little bit busy, but it's, it's been fun, so can't complain. I think within the next month or two, we're actually having Dr. Casa come to UW Lacrosse to be a visiting scholar and do a speech. So that'll be, yes. I think, anyway. Yeah, it's in April because um, there was going to be another trip kind of planned there where I was going to come out. Um, oh. But um, yeah, I know he's coming out to, to your way here in April. So I know he's, he's pretty pumped because um, um, he's actually never been to Madison. Actually, well, that's unfortunate. It's a place yeah, you, so don't, I, that you don't want to miss. Yeah, yeah. So he's going to spend some time down there, I think. So we should be yeah. but cool. Um. So, kind of the first question we had is, you know, you covered it a little bit, but what actually like drove your focus to it? Um, was that something coming out of Madison, or is it just the need that you saw uh, when you were in working in that at that high school once you got to UConn? Um. Really, it was really once I started my graduate work at, at UConn, um, getting involved from a research perspective, um, at least with my master's thesis, and and having having Dr. Casa as my former advisor, who's you know a world renowned expert in, in hedonism, and and seeing his seeing his passion on the topic um, was um, kind of invigorating. It's like wow, this is really cool, um, and then just getting more um, going more in depth into the literature as far as what the evidence is saying, where the current gaps are and whatnot. Um, I think another thing that was really cool and a, and a great experience for really any anyone who's never had a chance to um, to do this was having the opportunity to be able to volunteer at you know a large road races where um, um, you're you know providing care to, to runners. Um, so um, my first year volunteering at the Falmouth Road Race uh, was like 2011, um, 2011. 
um, and got to treat, you know, three heat strokes or three patients with exertional heat stroke um, at that race. Um, and that I think kind of really kind of hit home because it was, it was a, I, I guess I really can't describe the experience um, in, in words. It was just, it was, it was just a really cool experience to, to know that the actions that, you know, um, we did, and obviously it wasn't just myself, it, you know, we had other people in our, in our group, you know, we had, um, you know, athletic trainers and physicians and nurses. So we were, you know, we were a medical team being able to treat a, a runner who was running a race for fun, um, but came down with a medical emergency and, and saved their life right there. Um, and, and just knowing after the fact that if we didn't do the steps that we did at the race, um, the outcomes may not have been very good. Um, at all. Um, so I, I think that was really kind of put the cherry on top for kind of my passion and why I continue to go into that area is really the real world application of, of the stuff that we're doing and, and the, the the evidence and research we're, we're, we're disseminating in saving people's lives. I think that's that's really a, a big um, thing and, and seeing seeing patients' lives transform for the better because of the actions that we were able to do um, you know, immediately on hand. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, but mainly because you tap, uh, just touched on the topic. So you're working those road races, you know, you mentioned the full team. Um, there's been instances and occurrences where we, have, you know, and knowing people have covered, you know, similar road races, half marathons, so on and so forth. Um, physicians, nurses, um, also EMTs being involved with it where uh, heat issues were coming up, but there was miscommunication or issues in trying to figure out who needs to make the call on what. Um, certain people wanted to get them in the ambulance and get them to the ER ASAP. Others were, we need to cool them immediately. Um, you know, and to keep them here, and then eventually, yes, that's the option. But if we don't get them cooled, then some of that other stuff doesn't necessarily um, mean a whole lot. And so, it's kind of a two-part question: is a, where do you see like athletic trainers fitting into that situation when you've got multiple other healthcare professionals? And then you can tie into it at any point because it's another question. But just kind of the best practices that you'd see in like that instance, you know, the big road race um, specifically. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I think the biggest thing, um, if you want to put an overarching theme on my answer, um, is going to be communication. Um, yeah, is, is communication. And that, that's something I try to hit home with my students is communication. And obviously communication it can take the form of different avenues, different reasons why you have to have communication. But I think for your question, I, I think it's an excellent question. And um, communication, I think, is an essential aspect of making sure that the, the medical care that we are providing to patients um, is streamlined and everyone that needs to be involved is involved and everyone understands the policy procedures. Um, so your question with the road race is excellent because I, I, I've, I've heard of, of colleagues in scenarios and, and know of races where um, the EMTs are the only ones that provide medical coverage. And if there's a suspected heat illness, the EMTs are going to put them in the, in, in the ambulance and ship them to the hospital. And we know that in, in evidence that's the worst thing to do because the ambulance is, is not equipped with the proper cooling modalities to cool them on the route to the hospital. Um, and we know with the exertional heat stroke, the longer that they're above that critical threshold for cell damage, so the longer they're above 105 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the, 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 worst, the worse off they are potentially from a, a long-term sequela or even, even in the case of, of, of the death. Um, so being able to, to develop a medical team um, at a road race, for example, that you know, it's open communication and, and policies and procedures that are developed, I, I think is key. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to um, publish a, a short commentary in athletic training and sports healthcare. I believe it was last year and it was really focused on the organization and, and um, the organization of medical care at, at mass participation events such as a road race. Um, and uh, uh, um, some close friends and colleagues joined me on that publication and, and one of them, um, um, two of them were um, um, either road race directors or a uh, medical coordinator um, for, for large, large races and really getting their feedback and experiences as far as what, what uh, are the ways that they found with their careers to make sure that the medical care is, is streamlined and, and seamless across 
different people from different backgrounds and experiences, especially at a road race where they're all, people are just volunteering their time, is how do we get everyone on the same page? Um, and it comes down to communication, disseminating the proper protocols, procedures, or one, really developing the, the protocols, and procedures um, with a medical team. So developing a medical team that's, that's there, it, it includes members in the community, EMS, the hospital, you know, physicians, athletic trainers, you know, police, security, et cetera, in, in, involving them into a medical committee, deciding on policies and procedures based on that lo location, right? You know, the medical procedures and policies for Boston are going to be different than Falmouth, Massachusetts because of locations and, and, right. and care. So being able to develop those policies, procedures that are evidence-based, um, and then being able to d disseminate that information to the volunteers that are volunteering for the race is essential, making sure that everyone's on the same page and everyone knows the chain of command and who reports to who and what's going to happen in certain scenarios is is essential. And that's the that's really the driving factor of what's going to be a successful day or, or not, um, is that communication. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know if this is putting you too much on the spot, but general best practices that you've seen for those type of things since you did a commentary on it. Yeah. Obviously no. with the caveat that each one is unique, but. Yeah, no, great question. And I, I think best practices, and I'm going to relate it back to the, the conditions themselves, right? So if we, if we look at a, um, at a mass participation event, like a road race, thinking about, okay, what injuries are we likely going to see? Right. And we know that, on a normal day that's not too hot, we know that we'll see um, in, across the race course in the medical tents and, and, and the, the um, patient exposures, we'll see about five to 8% of those, of those runners participating in some type of, in, in a capacity where they need some type of medical care. And that could be simple as just, you know, getting band-aids for blister or right. cardiac arrest. Um, so I think really, you know, thinking about, okay, well, we have a running race that's going to be taking place this time of year. What do we need to have on hand? And it's really going back as far as, okay, what conditions are we likely to see? And that could be the catastrophic or just the minor orthopedic stuff that um, still needs to be addressed, but it's not as, as, as life-threatening as a cardiac arrest or a surgical heat stroke. And then going from that perspective, then identifying, okay, what do we need to have on hand to make sure that those conditions are treated appropriately when if those were to happen. Um, so from a of heat stroke perspective, making sure that there are there are tubs for um, cold water immersion, making sure that there are rectal thermometers to take a, a rectal temperature, making sure that there's a plane in place that, you know, if if um, we cool them down and they happen to, you know, um, have issues after we cool them down, there's a plan to get them to the hospital or there's a there's a, re a plan to monitor them for recovery perspective. So thinking about other things there is is really essential, but it's really rooted back to what is current evidence telling us in, in scientific and medical literature and what do we need to have on hand. So heat stroke, yeah, we need to make sure that we have a rectal thermometer and cold tubs um, or another way of providing, you know, whole body um, cooling. For sudden cardiac arrest, make sure that we have AEDs on hand, you know, making sure that we have the equipment that we need on hand to make sure that those things are managed in a timely and expedient manner. Definitely. Um, kind of tearing off of that, is there any equipment that you've seen coming out other than a big tub full of ice cold water? Um, obviously, the thermometers and the AEDs that are showing promise to help potentially prevent or even to treat um, thing, issues like this? Um, from, I guess, the heat illness perspective, since that's the world that I live, that I live yeah. in, I'm most likely, I'm you know, most informed there. Um, you know, we have, you know, there's companies that are, that are continuously um, developing um, devices and products to, um, to cool the body down. Um, and some may be more effective than others. I think um, a, a big thing with, with any of this is really, um, and it goes back on, on the companies and, and themselves, is, is spending the time to do the proper and appropriate research needed to test their device to make sure that, hey, yeah, my device can cool the body down, but it's cooling the body at a, at a rate that's, that's acceptable for treating a, a, you know, a, a heat illness. Um, and I, you know, I've done studies where we've had um, devices that we've tested that just don't work. I mean, they cool the body down, but the rate of cooling is similar to me just sitting in a chair, not moving. Um, 
So, it, you know, it, we've been ineffective. Um, we've had some devices that cool the body, but don't cool it at a rate that is needed to rapidly reduce internal body temperature if someone's, you know, on 104 degrees. Um, what is that rate off the, if you don't mind, off the top of your head? Yeah, so if you're looking at an exertional heat stroke and, and the timing of cooling, we want to make sure that we can cool them to um, below that critical threshold and really ideally to 102 degrees Fahrenheit within 30 minutes of collapse. Um, so you look at the cooling rates and, and what's needed, you know, we need to make sure that a cooling modality should at least be, um, you still there? Yep. Sorry, I, my computer just timed down on me. Um, so making sure that we have a cooling rate that's at least above um, 0.155 Celsius per minute, which is, um, I think, uh, about... 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Okay. I, I don't don't quote me on that conversion, but I know. Um, we'll we'll fact check the the Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion. Yeah, I would I would fact check the, yeah. the Celsius uh, centigrade perspective. So for everyone else in the world except for the United States, right, it uses the metric system. Uh, above 0.15 Celsius per minute is the, the optimal cooling rate that we would need to make sure that we can take someone from. 108 degrees Fahrenheit or 109, 110. I've treated patients that are 111 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, from that down to 102 within 30 minutes. So, um, you know, if we have a cooling rate of 0 0.06, that's just not going to be sufficient. You're really right. long amount of time that they're hyperthermic, and you're you're extending the amount of time that their their proteins and 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 muscles are and tissues are breaking down within their body to cause long term damage. Awesome. Um, I've seen different things and different kind of one-liners on, especially when like an event happens that there's almost no reason that we can't get them down if the appropriate thing, you know, steps are taken to do it. Um, so that sure, but what are you seeing and what you've done and the research and you're talking now about, uh, you're talking about hydration and whatnot. Um, is your current uh, current focus like how preventable do you think these situations are? Fantastic question. Um, I always tell people from a, from an exertional heat stroke perspective, we can take steps to prevent or reduce the risk of the 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 event from occurring. Now, yep. with exertional heat stroke and even with other medical emergencies, um, you know, we, we can't prevent those 100 percent, right? For, so, from exertional heat stroke. We can have a heat acclimatization protocol for preseason practice. We can we can modify um, practice and training based on environmental conditions, right? So we can modify the work to rest ratios based on the environmental um, heat exposure that they're exposed to, re so to reduce the the um, the heat exposure on their on place in their body. Um, we can make sure that we have individualized hydration plans to make sure that people are adequately hydrated during training and competition to reduce risk. But, you know, with, with exertional heat stroke and, and since it can be caused by such a, a large number of factors, we can't prevent it 100%. Now, what we can do is exertional heat stroke is 100% survivable if the appropriate steps are taken to recognize and to appropriately manage the, the condition. And that is really, if we suspect a heat illness, we observe, you know, CNS dysfunction, um, taking a inaccurate temperature, taking a rectal temperature to be able to differentiate, is it a exertional heat stroke or is it another potential medical emergency that causes CNS dysfunction? We need to be able to differentiate that, right? Um, and then if we are able to observe CNS dysfunction and have a high rectal temperature, put them into a, 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 a um, cold water tub, um, ice water tub to cool them down um, and, uh, aggressively. Um, so like I said, if, if those steps are taken immediately, um, we, we know that the, the survival rate's hundred percent. Um, and that's based on data we published from Falmouth Road Race and, um, you know, it, publication from 2015 looked at 274 cases of heat stroke at this one road race, hundred percent survival. Um, and since, since that time we've, we've added another hundred and hundred, almost 200 cases on top of that data set, um, since that initial study was published. Um, still 100% survival rate, but the appropriate things are done. A rectal temperature is taken, assess your temperature, and the decision is made to then um, identify what is going to be the mode of treatment, in this case, cold water immersion. So, you know, we have some pretty convincing evidence showing that. Um, um, so, again, we can't prevent it from occurring, 
right. they minimize the risk, but it is 100% survivable if we do the appropriate steps as healthcare providers. That makes a lot of sense and survival. That was the word I was looking for. Thank you for throwing that in there. <laughs> well, anything else around heat and hydration that you'd like to cover that kind of exhausted the big questions that I had for you and ones that I thought would be highly beneficial for everybody to hear, but anything else that we're missing that you'd like to chat about? Uh, I think I'm, I'm trying to think back of questions that I always get um, on the topic with the exertional heat stroke and, and you know, they're, um, and there's always a lot. And I think some of the questions that I get are, you know, hey, I'm an athletic trainer and I work in a high school setting and all my patients are, are minors. Um, you know, that, that whole concern or, or the concern with privacy with, with taking your rectal temperature or right. the invasiveness of, of the measure. And, and obviously that is a concern in, in, in the world that we live in. And, and um, the, I guess the response that I always provide back to those, um, those individuals is, you know, we know that this is this is the gold standard. This is what's currently outlined as best practices in scientific and medical literature. This is what um, we are um, we are upheld to when it comes to a standard of care. Um, and in in my talks, I actually outline and go through what the standard of care is and what that definition means. Right. Um, and then show the supporting position statements and consensus statements as far as hey, this is the re these are the resources that athletic trainers can utilize to 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 um, utilize to educate the proper persons, whether it be school administrators or parents and and whatnot, as far as why they're doing why they would be doing those treatments, um, and providing the evidence saying yeah, if this if 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 we, you don't follow these steps um, and there's a bad outcome, you better believe that these documents will be coming back into play um, as you're sitting in a courtroom and the prosecution is, is questioning why you didn't follow the standard of care. Right. Um, and, you know, so that, I think that's the biggest thing and, and, and um, that I always try to um, address with people because those are real questions. Um, and, and whatnot, and, and and as far as you know, taking a rectal temperature, yeah, it's it's an invasive measure similar to an AED. You know, an AED is applying an electric shock throughout the body. That's just as invasive as 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 uh, any other any any other measure. But there are steps that we can take to to take that measurement um, in a way that you're maintaining the the patient's privacy, um, and it's being done by yourself as a healthcare provider who's trained and and licensed as a healthcare provider in that state to be able to do that. Um, so there are ways to minimize. Um, you know, exposure risks there, um, and it's just, it's just, I think, um, being educated and shown and trained in how to really do it. I think that makes a lot of sense, yeah, I, when you frame it, that if you don't follow the gold standard and those things come back, it's going to get you that it, you could also make the argument that if something came up on the other end about it you know being invasive and whatnot you're also those documents could be a huge benefit to you because you are following the standard and what is the protocol so yeah I, that's a really unique insight yeah yeah i mean and i think another, and i always provide the example too especially with heat stroke because you know they're going to have some type of observable cns dysfunction right right um, look at other medical emergencies that may exhibit a CNS dysfunction, you'll get, you know, traumatic head trauma. So uh, a hemat uh, you know, subdural epidural hematoma, they may present with, you know, CNS dysfunction, respiratory distress, cardiac um, uh, distress, um, you know, hyponatremia, exertional sickling, they may present as some type of CNS dysfunction. And if you're not doing what you can to um, utilize a diagnostic tool, which is what rectal temperature is, is a diagnostic tool to exclude or include certain conditions, you're really, you're really at a, at a loss as far as, I, you know, using the appropriate treatment after, after that. Makes sense. So I think that's all I, that's all I have on that topic. So awesome, yeah, no, that's <laughs> off. That was, I was looking forward to chatting with you just, hey, for my own update on the knowledge and whatnot. But I think again, it's just one you've seen more, on the, in the headlines, and so making sure that it's getting out there as much as it can, I think, is hugely important. So, with that, on to the athletic training chat questions. All right. What does being an athletic trainer mean to you? Uh, I know being an athletic trainer to me um, means that you're, you know, you're you're a qualified healthcare provider. That you know, you're 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 
Well, let me think about that for a second. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would seem easy to find until you actually have to do it. Yeah, right. Now I read these questions. I'm like, oh, that, that's a, that'd be an easy question to answer. Um, you know, I guess in, in my mind, being an athletic trainer is, is being someone who's uh, a licensed healthcare um, provider that um, can deal with sport-related injuries, you know, whether it be the prevention, the recognition, management, the treatment, the return to play, is being an advocate for the patients you're working with. And, you know, I'm not going to say athletes because, you know, obviously athletic training is like expanded to include more than just athletes, you know, right. the, you know history, military and performing arts. So it's really, um, you know, putting your patient's um, best interest at hand and making sure that what they're doing and the jobs that they're tasked to perform are done so in a safely manner. And I think that we are a great um, um, conduit in making sure that that is happening. I like that. That's a good def good definition of it. What advice would you go back and give yourself as a young athletic trainer? And you can place this wherever you want to, so if that's undergrad or grad school or whatnot, but. That's a great question. Um, if I give myself any advice as a young athletic trainer, um, hmm. I wish that um, I'm, I'm trying to think back at my time when I was at the high school during my, during my master's degree, and um, you know. I myself, whenever I'm, I'm working with a patient and evaluating an injury or, or an issue and, and going through the process, um, you know, I, I always try to take the extra time to educate um, educate the patient or, you know, educate the parent in the case of a high school athlete or, or both. Um, you know, so thinking back to now and um, or thinking back um, there and as advice that I would give uh, myself would be just to put more emphasis on that education piece. Um, there is so much misinformation out there about everything related to medical care and, and health care and, and injuries and, and pathologies and, and whatever whatever else you want to put in, in the right. bubble um, that, um, you know, with simple education, I think you, you're really addressing a lot of those issues. So, you know, as much as I spent time educating my patients and patients' parents and coaches and, and administrators, um, I, I wish I would have put a little bit more emphasis and making sure that was um, a, a more um, prioritized part of my plan of the athlete. You know, evaluating the injury, doing the rehabilitation and the return to play and, and doing all that's essential. But making sure that the education is embedded without within each of those processes with the respective and appropriate individuals, um, just to make sure that they're they're fully aware of what's going on and what's going on in their bodies and why we're doing certain things, I, I think is essential. Um, and it really kind of helps address some of the other concerns that athletes may be faced with from a, a psychological approach as well. Uh, education is, is key. Makes a lot of sense. What has been one of, if not the most influential resource that you have found in your career? Hmm. Ah, uh, man, that's a, uh, there's so many that I think. Um, <laughs> Feel um, free to name a few. Yeah. Um, not that strict. No, I think the, you know, most influential resource sources, I'll, I'll say plural, are, are um, you know, peers and, and colleagues that have gone through similar circumstances. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to my graduate work at U University of Connecticut and, and having my, you know, having my former advisor being, being Doug Casa and just his experiences in his career, um, just a great resource. Being able to bounce ideas off of him and, and utilize that that mentorship um, that was provided there um, was was great. Um, other you know peers and colleagues that have faced situations that you know, I, I may be experiencing for the first time, and that could be an injury, that could be dealing with certain patient populations, could be dealing with, you know, you name it, um, being able to utilize resources um, that are at my disposal to make sure that, um, you know, I'm doing the best that I can and, and really make sure that I'm doing best by my patient, um, what it comes down to is identifying those resources. That seems to be a very common theme, preceptors and mentors and <laughs> colleagues, which I think it makes, that makes a lot of sense. If you could change or eliminate one thing, modality, a common practice, a mindset, or anything else in the field of athletic training, what would it be? Oh, that's, that is 
a loaded question. Um, <laughs> let's see if I could change one thing. Um, and actually, I'm going to focus on the mindset piece because actually, a, a good friend of mine, um, she skyped into our um, into one of our weekly meetings with our with our um, our students last week, the week before, and she was talking about work life balance issues. Um, oh, all right. And it was great because you know, obviously that's a, that's a huge concern in athletic training, and and you know um, a lot of times, unfortunately, issues related to attrition and burnout and people leaving our profession is is work life balance. And um, you know, what, one thing that I, I wish that would change would be the mindset related to um, re related to how we view view that as athletic trainers. And you know, I think we're kind of wired in a sense where, you know, where we want to be athletic trainers because we want to help people. We want to be healthcare providers. Um, so we want to do what's best for, for the athlete. And when, you know, a lot of times, yeah, we have to do what's best for our athlete or patient in, in that matter. Um, but really we have to take care of ourselves too. And, and, and what that means is different per person, right? Um, that could take on a whole another series of, of things, but making sure that you're taking care of yourself um, just as much as as any anything else. And um, so, I think that's the one thing I wish that would change be the mindset as far as you know. Yeah, I need to put um, my my work and my patients I'm caring for um, as, as a priority, but I also need to make sure that I myself am in in that same place and making sure I'm taking care of myself the same way. Um, just as much of a priority there. And I, I think that, you know, would address some of the other um, issues um, associated um, with some of the uh, other burnout attrition issues that we're seeing. I like it. I couldn't agree more. Um, that was a heavy dose of leaving Division One to come down to Division Three. The work-life balance just made life a whole lot better. Where do you see the athletic training profession going in the next five to ten years? Yeah, I mean, I think I think athletic training is in general is in a really unique transition period, um, especially with you know the education programs tra transitioning from a bachelor's level program to an entry level master's program. Um, I, I think that we're going to see some um, changes. I think for the better. Um, you know, oftentimes um, you know people complain of of you know inadequate pay and there's other issues associated with that. And I, I think that um, excuse me. I think with this transition, I, I think that um, you know, we are um, addressing a couple issues. I, I think that we're going to um, attract people into our profession that want to be athletic trainers. Like they see themselves as an athletic trainer. It goes back to that whole attrition piece. Um, um, so we're, we're, we're attracting people that want to be athletic trainers to stay in the profession. Um, you know, I think, you know, following the, the trajectory of, of getting a degree as an entry level master's program, hopefully in the eyes of employers and, and you know, in, in healthcare as, a gener as in general, um, you know, we're able to um, put ourselves higher up in, in, in that, I guess, totem pole, of, totem pole, if you will, and use that analogy, um, to make sure that we are being compensated for what we're valued and what we're worth. Um, and that actually kind of goes back to my previous comment about one thing that I wish that we would change and, and, and everything would be, um, you know, I think that um, um, as a whole, I, I don't think athletic trainers do the, the best job advocating for themselves globally. Now, some do a tremendous job. Right. And, um, some approach that, um, in ways that I can't, I would never be, you know, be able to be, be able to, you know, be able to think of, right. um, and and others don't. And, and I always tell my students to advocate. And I had a student in the other day talking about, hey, I'm applying for jobs, and my job, my job application is asking me what's the minimum salary I should take. And it was a good learning opportunity for the student because you know I was like, well, in my opinion, this is the approach I would take. And you know, we went through various steps as far as okay, what's it going to cost to live? You know, right. You know, you have rent, you have student loan debt, you have this, this, this. So factor all that in, and what's going to be the minimum amount of money that you you need to, to live? Um, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's actually a good, good thought. So I think being able to advocate for ourselves and to be able to um, advocate for what we deserve, and that could be compensation for, for this example, or it could be really anything. Um, right. Um, so, yeah, those, those two things are kind of tied between those two two questions, but no, I, th I think athletic training will continue to grow. I um, mean, it's great to see the growth we've seen in our profession, um, expanding outside of our, our traditional setting, if you will, um, getting into military and um, um, in industry and performing arts and, you know, other, other areas that um, 
are being helped, I guess, if you if you use that terminology, from our expertise and our training. Um, so I, I, I think that we'll continue to see that growth. I think we'll continue to see a, a large return on investment for the services that we're providing to our patients and, you know, for the employer or whoever's employing us. Um, yeah. So that, I think mean, those are the big things where I see us going in the future. Awesome. Well, kind of in closing then, um, anything else you want to share? And if you're so willing to share, if people want to connect with you, what would be the best way? Yeah. Um, Feel free to reach out to me via email. It's wmadams at uncg.edu. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. It's at William underscore M underscore Adams. Um, you know, those those methods are, are good ways to connect with me um, if there's any questions or follow-up or, or anything like that. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and being on the podcast.